Okay, yeah, I uh, wanted to start out by just uh, thanking the uh, Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement for having this discussion, uh, especially, I mean, this may not be the most relevant discussion regarding what's going on in the world right now as far as our personal lives, but regardless, uh, I think it's great that, you know, Sandy and Robin have work together to put this together. Otherwise, I assumed about a week ago when I talked to Sandy that this was pretty much a no-go. And then she said that, you know, Robin had been working on uh, and had successfully done a, a, a session last week uh, or about two weeks ago, I think. And uh, I was thrilled that we're continuing to engage with one another on local issues, you know, as local as things like, you know, Burlington Telecom to something as exotic and different as Kashmir in India. And we talked about Haiti a few weeks ago. So I, this is just great. And I'm glad that given the uh, COVID-19 virus, we're still trying to form a sense of community and have this, uh, have this discussion. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, just get a, a show of hands. How familiar are folks with general aspects of Indian history? Uh, Zero. <laughs> okay, no, there, there's no, there's no right answer here. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> the, the reason the reason I'm I'm bringing this up was because I want to tailor the conversation a certain way. Uh, a lot of times, even when I've you know been party to conversations about parts of the world that I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of get thrown off if there are a lot of names that are thrown at me, historical names that, you know, that I may not know. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to keep those names to a minimum. I'm just going to read out a quick list of some of those names. And if, uh, if a fair number of people have not heard of these people, then I want to, you know, possibly uh, I'll take it in a different direction. And again, this isn't to make people feel bad. I want to make people, you know, participate. So, I mean, uh, I'm going to go with the, the list of names. Mahatma Gandhi, probably most people know that name. Yes. Ne Nehru, he was the first prime minister of India. Yep. Uh, Jinnah was the uh, first prime minister of Pakistan, if folks don't know him. Don't uh, know. Okay, that's okay. And Bhutto... The, there were two. There, there was a, uh, a, a, a man who was the prime minister and president of Pakistan in the early 1970s. And then his daughter in the 1980s, Benazir Bhutto, became the first woman to lead an Islamic nation. And she was actually voted in. So I'm going to be using that name. Uh, the other name is Indira Gandhi. No, no relation to... Mahatma Gandhi, she was actually Nehru's daughter. She just happened to marry another guy named Gandhi, but no relation to the Mahatma Gandhi. And then the two other names I'll mention, Modi. Modi's the current prime minister of India. And then finally, Lord Mountbatten. Lord Mountbatten was the viceroy, the last viceroy of India. Viceroy was sort of like a governor general. And he... Um, he took part and oversaw the division and partition of India uh, right after the Second World War. So I'm going to keep it the, to those names. I'm not going to go beyond that because I think a lot of times in people, what happens is, uh, you know, you, you get lost in the names and then you start losing interest in the, in the overall discussion. It, does that sound okay? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, so, can I ask you a question, Kurt? Yeah, go ahead. The, the most, I think, unfamiliar name to me is Jinnah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I did read, I did happen to read something about him. But going back to the partition, was he the first prime minister of Pakistan? Yes, he was. He was okay. involved. He, he, the, uh, the, the movement to, to acquire independence from Great Britain uh, from the subcontinent of India uh, consisted of some of the more notable people like Gandhi. He's probably the most well-known. And then Nehru. And there was a department within this independent movement, uh, independence movement. And it was 
the it was called the Muslim League. Mm, okay. Right. Mm. Okay, so the Mus the chairman of the Muslim League. There were a lot of notable great men and women in that league, but Jinnah was probably the most well known, uh, and that's why he, it, it, you know, he was eventually chosen as the first and elected as the first prime minister of Pakistan. Okay. So that's just a little blurb about Jinnah. Yeah. Okay. As far as he was. Uh, you know, so he's considered the father of Pakistan, and he really was because he was instrumental instrumental in create and helping push for the creation of that country. And that was in 1947. That was 47, correct? Two years after the Second World War, and uh, same year that Israel declared its independence. Right. Uh, from so, again, from Great Britain. For, uh, uh, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, yes, from Great yeah, Britain, and yeah. Burma, and Burma, that was uh -huh. all one area. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenna sent me an email a little while ago uh, saying that if I pull up a picture that you guys should be able to see it, and the only pictures I'm going to use today are maps. I would have done a better audio-visual presentation if we were meeting in person. I'm not really technical, technically savvy, and uh, I didn't want today to be the uh, day that I experimented with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to pull up this map. If it does, if you can't see it, then I'm going to take Robin's advice. Robin Lloyd told me, you know, just hold up the map, and we'll let you know if we can see it. Uh, so I'm going to just as an experiment try to pull up this map and see if and let me know if you guys can see the map. Okay. Uh, so, so just, can I, uh, just one thing, I received yes. an email about 15, 20 minutes ago with a bunch of maps. Oh, of, okay. Uh, uh, great, great. Those are the maps I'm going to be working with. And I don't know if I folks have the capability of looking at their email right now. All of us. Well, I don't want to. I mean, we don't really dare. Okay, can you see this image right now that I have on the screen? No. no, not really. Okay. All right, so forget about that. Okay. What, uh, okay. what, what, what uh, do we do? Give it, give it one more moment more. Sure. Um, Kurt, you if you click on chat and then um, file, you may be able to post it that way. Uh, let's just have him hold it up. I don't want to lose this, and I'm uh, just nervous about it. Okay. All right. Uh, so. Let's see how this looks. Okay, this is a. Yeah, that's okay. Maybe that's a current you map back. of yeah. India. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. Okay. So, all right. So that's that's the way we'll do it. We'll try to keep it simple. Uh, okay, we'll hold so, it up again. Okay. No, I mean when it's relevant, I'll, right. I'll hold it up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the reason I'm doing this is Sandy Baird and I had a conversation. Uh, a few months ago, and uh, you know, in the in the midst of the conversation, you know, Sandy said that, boy, it's really difficult for Cuba a lot of times, uh, and and Russia, and I, I I forget the third country, Venezuela, Venezuela, possibly getting a fair shake in in the press, and I kind of jokingly said, well, a lot of times, yeah, I I see that with respect to India too, and Sandy said, really, and I said, yeah, I said based on the knowledge I have, it doesn't quite comport with a lot of the uh, coverage that I'll see, honestly, ever since I was a little kid. Uh, so that so then invited me and said, you know what, why don't you do a little talk about India at some point? Because a lot of times people, you know, people know that the country exists and people will look, you know, see uh, some basic articles in the press, you know, covering it, uh, the, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. But a lot of times people won't know a whole lot. And if we, you know, Sandy and I worked on Cuba together. If we judged Cuba based on what we read in the press, we wouldn't really have a very favorable image about that country at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, you know, one of the reasons I thought I would do this. And I wanted to start out by talking about, well, why is that the case? Why uh, is a lot of press coverage with respect to India often negative. In, in some cases, it's, it's, it's warranted. But then in other cases, a lot of times it's never made sense to me. So I'm going to give you a couple of reasons. These are my theories. Uh, and uh, one of the theories is, and this is common to Cuba also, 
is that after independence, uh, India was not open to any foreign co uh, corporations coming in and doing business with it. Uh, the Cubans throughout the corporations, the foreign corporations, namely the American corporations, the, India never invited them in. And that was a cardinal sin, I think, on India's part as far as international politics were concerned because the country closed itself off. Uh, in the United States, uh, dignitaries and politicians were very disappointed with India because you had a massive population. At that point, at the time of independence, the country of India itself had a population in excess of 400 million people. Uh, Pakistan had a population over 100, 150 million people. But Pakistan opened their country up. They didn't have some of the same, uh, I'll call it a complex, that the Indian leadership had with respect to foreign corporations coming in uh, Why did and they doing have business. What, Robin? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, so namely, Robin, the reason the, the, the reason the Indian leadership had was because of their experience with the British. Uh, and when I say the British, I'm not talking about the British people, I'm talking about a corporation that was, uh, that was called the, the British East India Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Br the British East India Corporation uh, was probably one of the most wealthy uh, and successful, depending on how one judges success, corporations in the history of, of the world, really. It was a, a corporation in the, in the most modern sense in that it, it sold stock to shareholders. Uh, a, a fairly large portion of the British Parliament in the 16 and 1700s held stock in that corporation because the corporation, uh, their, their balance sheets were extremely, extremely positive and it was a great way to make money. Uh, mm -hmm. So even if, uh, even if parliamentarians in Britain disagreed with some of the excesses and some of the, uh, some of the uh, actions that the corporation took, uh, their, their share dividends were substantial, substantial, and they paid handsomely. And uh, that was, that, what happened was the, when, the, when, the, when the British East India Company charted itself, Queen Elizabeth I was still the reigning queen of, of, of Great Britain. Uh, the, the corporation was chartered in the year 1600, mm -hmm. and it was, it was selling stock, and it was, um, it was, it was considered a, a means for uh, the shareholders to acquire a great deal of wealth. Uh, now, what was different about that corporation compared to some of the biggest corporations that we have in our country now, at least in the United States as we know them, such as, such as Walmart, such as Apple, such as Google and Amazon, is that when the British East India Corporation or company secured its charter, the charter had a provision that allowed it to raise its own private security force. That's, that's really important in the conversation that we're gonna have today. That security force became one of the best trained armies in the world over time. And gradually it was able to take over a lot of the developing world and specifically in this case, most of India in the process in, 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 in slow increments. So uh, I wanna start out, so that was, that's one of the cardinal sins, uh, the, uh, the fact that, the, that India was really gun shy, allowing foreign corporations from coming in because of the experience that it had, Robin, with the, the East India Company, the British East India Company. Uh, so it, it, was, it, it did damage the, comp the country because it, the country didn't have a lot of resources in manufacturing at the time of independence. Uh, but at the same point, there was a great deal of um, animosity, uh, insecurity on the part of the Indian leadership to invite other companies to come in and to help in the development of the country. The second, the second cardinal sin that India committed was uh, it created a strong relationship. Its foreign policy was, at the time, 
uh, considered progressive, however, unattractive and bothersome uh, and inconvenient for the United States at the time. Now, remember, this is right after the Second World War. Uh, the USSR and India were, you know, basically engaged in a chess match of trying to acquire countries on their side. India tended to, despite the fact that it created itself as a democracy and a liberal one at that, it, it had, more, uh, had more things in common with the Soviet Union. And it allied itself with the Soviet Union on many issues, not in its form of government and uh, economic system, but with respect to a lot of the causes the uh, Soviet Union had. Uh, so India was close with the PLO. India was close with Cuba. And hold on. So yeah. can I, I, everybody know the PLO is Palestine. The Palestine. Yeah, so the Palestinian Liberation Organization, you know, most of us probably know it, you know, it was headed by Yasser Arafat, at least in my lifetime. Right. Uh, and uh, so India had developed these, these strong bonds with countries that often had progressive and, and in, in the Palestinian case, the, this, this organization, not a country, uh, but these organizations slash countries, entities that had a strong anti-colonialist bend, and, but at the same time were very, in, you know, the, the, their actions were very inconvenient for, uh, for the United States, and therefore led to a uh, alliance with, with the Soviet Union. And that was something that was not something that the United States was very keen on. Uh, so, Kurt? Yes. You uh, mentioned that they were also aligned with Cuba. Yes. Well, Cuba was yeah. until 1960, so. Correct, so I'm, I'm talking, when I say uh, the alliance, this was post, uh, post Cuban revolution. And okay. could, could I jump in also and ask sure. about the, the non-aligned movement? Right. I mean, that yes. a, maybe you're going to get to it, so. Yeah, so okay. no, I'm glad you brought it up. I had it in my notes, but I'm glad you brought it up, Robin. So uh, the first prime minister of India, Nehru, uh, what he did uh, in the early 1950s is he formed an organization called the Non-Aligned Movement in the world. Uh, again, that was a major thorn on the side of the United States. The United States didn't believe in non-alignment at the time. Uh, the, the first secretary of state in the late 1940s that visited India uh, it was, uh, I believe it was John Foster Dulles, and he yep. told Nehru point blank, listen guys, you need to choose. You know, it's, it's either us or them. Uh, this, you know, this neutrality nonsense isn't going to get you very far. Uh, Nehru stuck to his guns. Now, whether they were really non-aligned, I mean, they, they, they were aligned with, uh, for the most part, there was a friendship treaty that they executed with the, with the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, the next prime minister of India, Indira Gandhi, was very close to Fidel Castro. Uh, and India also had a lot, of, uh, a lot of relationships with other countries that the United States was, wasn't too crazy about. Including, uh, the, including the PLO? Yeah. Very, uh, Indira Gandhi, the first female prime minister, or I guess the only female prime minister in India's history, uh, was, uh, and just to give you a time frame, we're talking uh, late 1960s, uh, right until she was killed in, the, uh, in 1984. Uh, very good friends with Fidel, very good friends with uh, Yasser Arafat mm -hmm. uh, of the PLO. Uh, that changes later, that relationship with the, the PLO as well as with Israel in the last 10, 15 years. I'll get to that later. Uh, so, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, I wanted to uh, hold up a map of uh, this is uh, this is a map of India about twenty about twenty five hundred years ago. As far the reason I'm showing this is it prime ministers later such as Modi will often harken back to this golden age when you know a lot of times there's blame placed on the muslim minorities in that country as to you know what india once was and what it became after islamic rule 
So I'm just gonna hold this up just to give you a sense of the area of control that ancient India had in the world. So if you can't see this, let me know. Yeah, we can see it if you hold it up a little. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so, right. so this, is what, this is the area that we know as you know, the Indian subcontinent now. It includes Afghanistan, wow. pa modern Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia, Burma, and wow. Indonesia. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, if one travels to many of these countries, even in the Southeast Asia and as far uh, east as Bali uh, in Indonesia, you'll see uh, a, a great deal of um, ruins, uh, history, uh, and, uh, and even, you know, things like uh, cu cultural effects, cuisine, that you know that was essentially Indian, and the language was Indian. Uh, the religions of those areas were primarily the two biggest Indian religions, which were Hinduism and Buddhism at the time. Uh, that area shrank in the 13th century. What happened in the 13th century? Uh, the Mughal Empire uh, took over India. The Mughal em Empire. And I, I'm not going to go too far into history. I don't want to bore people, but the uh, but it's important with respect to the modern context just to know a little bit about it. The Mughals were a an Islamic civilization. They came from Central Asia and they invaded uh, the what we know now as the subcontinent of India. Uh, they they took it over, and the area of India of Indian you know influence shrank substantially. I'm going to hold up a map of what was known as the Mughal Empire from the 13th through the 17th centuries. Uh, this is it. Wow. So it's still a fair amount of uh, geography, but it's not this. Okay, so Kurt, can I ask, so that was the these people were were Islamic, correct? That's correct. All right. So they did they take Indonesia? No. Their their initial interest was to acquire the wealth that existed at the time in India. Okay. Uh, and I'll go a little bit into that once I, I talk a little bit more about the East India Company. Uh, and it was primarily in the area you know, of of gold, spices, uh, cotton, cloth. And uh, and diamonds. How about tea? Uh, not 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 yet. No, okay. tea was primarily a Chinese uh, thing that made its way into India, but it's uh -huh. the Chinese get credit for the tea. Okay. Uh, the Indians, I guess, they just drink it now. Uh, so uh, the uh, the uh, the Mughals ran the country. Uh, you know, so the country uh, country. I shouldn't. So when I say country, I, sh I should refer to it as a region. It wasn't a country with borders as we know nation states. Right. You know, that's largely a, a European advent to some right. extent. You know, so you had regions like Persia, you had India, you had, you know, other China, not with, not with rigid borders. Right. Uh, but, the, but the Mughals ran the country, ran the region uh, fairly effectively for several hundred years. Uh, they let the local population that was not that well, they brought Islam into India, but the, the portion of the population that did not want to convert into Islam, they pretty much left them alone to their own devices. They didn't really make many cultural changes uh, to, you know, to, to destroy Hindu or uh, Buddhist civilization. Uh, Islamic law was indeed put into place, uh, and that was very different from the uh, from from Hindu law or Buddhist law, which was probably a lot more laissez-faire on a lot of issues. Whether we talk about issues such as homosexuality, women's rights at the time, not mm -hmm. necessarily modern India now, but at the time, uh, as well as uh, you know sexual mores uh, and uh, habits of, of the people. Uh, women at the time were not fully covered. Uh, the, that was an anathema to uh, the, uh, the Islamic rulers of the time 
and they changed the requirements of dress to slightly, you know, cover up more. Uh, and a lot of those types of, you know, cultural things were, were changed, but for the most part, they really didn't interfere with people's lives and their ability to, you know, inter interact with one another. And, and Muslims and Hindus got along fairly well in, in, in uh, uh, from a, from a standpoint of, uh, business, personal relations, even intermarriage, uh, fairly common thing. Uh, so we're going to, so that, that, uh, that Islamic civilization was pretty firmly entrenched in India for about 350 years. There were changes, you know, the, the area of influence, uh, decreased significantly, but, uh, things were kind of going, okay, what changed? Uh, I, I mentioned previously the the East India Company yeah. came in in, in in 1600, and by and they were interested in the spice trade. Uh, that was mostly what they were interested in. And uh, the other thing that they had a great deal of interest in was uh, cloth textiles. Uh, so for about 150 years, uh, they were essentially conducting business on very good terms with with the Mughal Empire. What changed there? Uh, in, in, in the 1750s, something that we know in our country as the French and Indian War. Right, right, right. Not the, not, not the Indians in India, the other Indians. Right, uh, right. But the, the French Indian War uh, and what Europeans call the Seven Year War uh, took place throughout the world between, largely between France and England. Uh, now, how did, how did this affect India? Well, the French were also jockeying for position in certain portions of India. The province of India called Bengal was an area uh, that was of great interest to the French. I'm just gonna hold up a map of modern India and just point to where Bengal is in the scheme of things. So that's India, it's on the eastern. Take, take it a little further away from the, um, because, yeah. yeah. Can you see then, that guys? That's yeah. pretty good. Okay. So this area, which is modern day Bangladesh uh, and the city of Calcutta, uh, which was considered the capital of Bengal at the time, it's in Eastern India. Uh, that was the area where the British and the French fought on the Indi Indian subcontinent. Obviously they fought in as far away as North America and in the mainland of Europe, but as it pertained to India, they fought in that area of Bengal. Why Bengal? Bengal in the 1750s consists, their, their GDP as it related to the world was 12%. How much? 12% uh -huh. of the entire world GDP. Mm -hmm. Bengal is the poorest India, poorest area of India currently. If people know the city Calcutta, mm -hmm. uh, rich, wealth and rich, richness is not something that comes to mind right away. But in the 1750s, it was considered one of the richest areas of the world. The GDP exceeded that of the entire entirety of Western Europe at the time. Uh, so uh, the the British the British prevailed in that war, the Seven Years' right. War. Uh, our own General Washington uh, was that was his first military conflict here in North America. But if we go, you know, east east eastwards, the the, the British contingent were able to kick the French out. And in the process, they took over. Now, again, when I say the British, I'm talking about the East India Company. Right. Uh, not, not the British, the, the, the nation of you know, Great Britain uh, as it pertained to you know, the, the conflict in India. It was the East India Company that fought the French army in, uh, in, in the province of Bengal. And what was unfortunate for the Indians, the Bengalis, is they allied themselves with the French. I... So they lost, and they lost big. So what the East India Corporation did was not only did they kick the French out, they took over the province of Bengal from the, the local chieftain or king of the area. Uh, what did the British, uh, the East India Company find out when they took over Bengal? That Bengal was loaded. Uh, what was happening at the time was the, the English were competing with other Western European countries right. to jockey position because England at the time was one of the poorer countries of Great Britain, I mean, uh, of Europe compared 
to France and most notably compared to Spain. Spain was taking out massive amounts of gold from the, from the New World, uh, namely the, uh, the, uh, the Incan, Mayan, and Aztec empires, and, and shipping it into, in, in back home into Spain. Gre Great Britain, England did not have that luxury. But what they did find out, the East India Corporation, right. was that the, the kings in, uh, Is that okay? You're yeah. Yeah. in, in the province of, of Bengal, uh, had one quarter of the world's gold that, that had ever been mined w in its possession. They had exclusivity with respect to diamond mining. At, up until that time, that part of the world in India was the only place where there were diamond mines. Hmm. Not in Africa. Uh, Brazil discovered diamonds in the early 1800s. But up until the 1700s, the only place you can get diamonds was Eastern India. There were mines and the Bengali uh, population had taken advantage of mining diamonds and extracting them from the ground. Kurt, can I interrupt for a minute? Because I think sure. Jared wants to ask a question. I don't know where uh, he's Sure, going. yeah. Jared? No, no, I didn't have a question. I just thought, I just said Beth, Beth's question I thought was a good one. So yeah. I don't have any, any additional questions, but I didn't we're trying to think of good question. ones for you, Kurt. Just oh, give me a, a few minutes. Yeah, okay. Actually, oh, I'm sorry. Question. Okay, so uh, Beth, I just opened up the group chat. So I see you, you asked uh, what contributed to India's GDP then, or rather to Bengal. Well, I, I guess maybe I answered the question. It, it was, the, it was the, the mining of gold. It was the mining of diamonds, emeralds. They had also produced a... Uh, a rudimentary form of steel, which they were exporting at the time. And then of course, spices with the Middle East and cloth. So at the time the Mughal Empire fell to uh, the East India Company, the Indian share of GDP with respect to the world was 26%. Uh, that's, that's enormous. Uh, when, when the English left in 1947, the Indian share of GDP was 3%. So a pretty precipitous drop in, uh, in, a, in a little less than 200 years. Uh, so what the East India Company initially did when they found out about the incredible stock of diamonds, gold, as well as some of the other things I mentioned that they didn't know about was they began to load up ships and it was a couple of hundred ships pulled into uh, the Bay of Bengal they were completely loaded with gold and diamonds and sent back to, to, uh, to England. Uh, the, the corporate officers of uh, the East India Company became some of the richest men. They were all men at the time, so I'm using the term men. They, they became some of the richest men, not only in Great Britain, but in all of Europe. They also bought parliamentary seats in the British Parliament at the time. And further gave more and more deference to the East India Company. Uh, even though a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the English population at the time read really nasty reports about what the, uh, what the company was doing overseas, uh, not just in India, but other places, but the money was just too good for, the, for, for folks in parliament and for some of, the, uh, some of the wealthier corporate officers at the time. The other thing that they did revolutionary for a, uh, for a corporation was they established a tax on the residents of the area that they took over. So the tax pertained to any individual that owned land at the time. Uh, that became a huge boon for the British economy. Uh, England was a fairly, you know, the population wise, a uh, pretty small place in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the late 1700s, you're talking about 10 to 15 million. And then slowly as time went on and as the East India Company took more and more control over other areas of India with this really well-paid army that they, that they had uh, put together, some of which, which was uh, local hired guns from India itself, uh, they 
acqu they acquired a a tax base that exceeded 200 million people uh, as far as the area that was covered for and by by the 1940s at that point I'm sorry by the 1800s when Great Britain came in to overtake the East India Company's control Great Britain with Ireland had about a population of 28 million so uh, it was colonialization of the Indian subcontinent was an extremely lucrative venture that uh, that really couldn't be given up at the time so uh, you know what did the British bring to the uh, to the table in India they uh, they brought the railroads they were built in the late 1800s however can you can you guys still hear me? I just got a message yeah. that internet yes. connection is unstable. Okay, that's that's uh, mine. Always says that too. Okay. Okay. All right. So they 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 built the railroads, but what a lot of times people don't know is the railroads were built. However, they were not the, the railroads were not built for free. Uh, the Indian population was taxed, and they were, and when they've done a comparison. Of how much they were taxed, uh, the Indian population paid nine times what it cost to lay track in the United States. So for a distance in the United States, it cost about 2,000 British pounds at the time in the 1800s to lay track. The Indian population paid 18,000 pounds for each mile that was laid of track in India. So India did acquire a railroad, uh, but it wasn't for free. Uh, it, it was paid for. Uh, that, and that railroad, but regardless, is still used today uh, by uh, a vast portion of the population. Uh, so I'm going to go, I'm going to try to bring this a little closer to where, you know, the topic for, for this evening. Uh, and I'm going to go towards the end of British rule, because that is what, you know, uh, instru that's instrumental in, in, in the discussion that we're going to have today. The British were very successful in running India uh, by taking advantage of uh, a, a, a divide and conquer policy, which was not exclusive to the British and co co countries, the French, the Belgians, they all did this. What they did was they divided and conquered. What they often did was they gave uh, an excessive amount of power and respect to minor uh, one particular <clears throat> minority, uh, and what that would do is that would piss off the majority of the people in the country. Uh, the the French in Rwanda did it with the Hutus, pissing off the Tutsi uh, majority, uh, and in the case of India, the uh, what the British did was towards the, closer to towards independence in 1947 they gave a fair amount of deference to the Muslim League. Uh, and what that did was that created, or it, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say create, it exacerbated tensions between Hindus and Muslims in, in that country. Uh, and that was brought to a zenith at the time of independence when much of the Hindu independence movement leadership was was not placed in jail and they often dined at you know country, British country clubs and were involved in, in separation of India and what it would look like while the Gandhis and the, and the Nehru's of the world were put in prison for in, and they served multiple year sentences uh, when they came out of prison uh, they found that there was a new ruling elite in India and uh, a, a an elite that needed to be reckoned with and it was primarily Muslim. Uh, so even though these folks were friends just 10 years before, they became adversaries, uh, but, you know, at the time of independence. At the time of, uh, so as 1947 rolls by, and I'm getting to Kashmir now, as 1947 rolls by, uh, Lord Mountbatten and his wife, the Countess Edwina Mountbatten, were the, the viceroys of India. Uh, and when I say India at that point, I'm talking about the entire subcontinent, uh, including Bangladesh, Burma, and, uh, and Pakistan, of course. Uh, 
they were overseeing the, the partition of India into a Islamic state, which was going to be known as Pakistan, and a, and a Hindu majority but secular state, which was, known, which was going to retain the name India and continue with that name. Uh, so what happened? Uh, there were 562 principalities in this vast uh, area called the, uh, the, the subcontinent of India. And I'm just going to hold up a map of what the British had at that point and what they were dividing. And this is as of 1947, to give you a little bit of context. Damn it. Yeah, okay. You guys see this? Further away. Further Seems away. Like yeah. Okay, so I'm going to use a pen. So here we're talking, this is Burma, and this is, uh, if I've got that right, yeah, and this is what we know today as Pakistan over here. So still, you know, pretty large area here. This area up here is the area that we know now as Kashmir, and it was known then as Kashmir too. Uh, but uh, this part, Burma, was given its own nation in 1948, and this part of uh, the subcontinent was given to a entity called West Pakistan. Mm. And this part was called East Pakistan, which we now know as Bangladesh. I'm going to use the word Bangladesh because that's the word we use now. Uh, if I start talking about East and West Pakistan, right. people are going to get confused. And I don't, I don't want that. Uh, so going back to, five, uh, to 1947, each principality in India was given a choice who they wanted to join with. Did they want to become part of Pakistan or did they want to be part of India? Uh, and the local governors, in some cases they were kings, uh, the Islamic term for some of those areas, for some of those types of people, they were called Nawabs. Uh, they had to make a choice. Uh, of who they were going to go to. So there was a, a lot of horse trading going on, lobbying. Uh, Jinnah, the prime minister who, you know, the, the guy who became the prime minister of Pakistan, did his own jockeying in areas that were largely Muslim and was trying to attract them to join Pakistan. Nehru was trying to uh, do the same thing with areas that were primarily Hindu but also areas that were Muslim because he wanted to create this secular democracy. That's what he had in mind. Uh, so a lot of concessions were made to different areas. Uh, and the, the areas that Nehru was lobbying that had a large Muslim population, he assured the local Muslim population that they would be able to retain. Uh, I'm sorry. Was there a question? No, Robin was, doing something else. Oh, sorry. okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So yeah, no, that's all right. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so, so Nehru, when he was trying to appeal to Muslims in, in on the subcontinent, what he would say wa was, uh, that, uh, we, you know, that, uh, Islamic rights, uh, would be, uh, ass assured, uh, that, you know, the security would be assured, uh, and that they had nothing to worry about. Uh, it worked sometimes, and sometimes it didn't work. Some of those areas decided to join, join with Pakistan. Uh, so 561, by the end of 1947, 561 of the 562 mini states had decided it was a done deal. There was one that didn't, couldn't decide. They couldn't make up their mind. That one was Kashmir. Mm. Kashmir couldn't make up their mind. Were they going to join India or were they going to join Pakistan? Initially, what they communicated to Lord Mountbatten and his wife, Edwina Mountbatten, was, I think we're going to stay independent. And the English had, had well, Lord Mountbatten had a good laugh at that. He said, you're going to be between China, India, and Pakistan. Good luck maintaining your independence. You're a country of 12, you know, you're uh, an area of 12 million people compared to 200 million in the south, 150 million, and over close to a billion in the north. Uh, you better pick. Uh, so the reason there was this vexation on the part of Kashmir, because Kashmir was about 66% Muslim, 
However, the king of Kashmir was a Hindu. Mm. I don't know how that turned out that way, but that's just the way it turned out. That's the way it was. So he didn't want to move to Pakistan. He had convinced a fair portion of the Muslim population that was largely secular in Kashmir that we don't want to become part of an Islamic state. Pakistan, uh, the, the positive assurance that Pakistan was able to give to, to Muslims on the subcontinent was this was going to be a theocracy. And Islamic law, Sharia law, was going to be the law of the land. And for a lot of Muslims, that was a very attractive proposition. That wasn't necessarily an attractive proposition for the Muslims of Kashmir because they were very mixed. Nehru was a, a, a Kashmiri Hindu. Uh, today, you know, in terms of popular culture, if you know the author Salman Rushdie, you know, he's a Kashmiri. Uh, they were very integrated within Indian society, yet they were, they were, uh, they were Muslim by religion, a majority of them, two thirds of which uh, were Muslim. Uh, so what happened? Uh, the prince, uh, the king of Kashmir went back and forth, back and forth. How should I decide? How should I decide? He went to Mountbatten. He went to Jinnah. He went to Nehru, Jinnah, the prime minister of Pakistan. Uh, what should I do? In the middle of that, uh, going back and forth, uh, Pakistan became frustrated and they pushed uh, uh, tribes that were in the northwest frontier of Pakistan to invade Kashmir. They invaded all of Kashmir and Kashmir was absorbed into Pakistan initially, all of Kashmir. Uh, however, the king of Kashmir was upset about this. He appealed to India for assistance. India said, no way, we're not getting involved in a war yet. You know, or yet, uh, Freudian slip. Uh, we didn't want to get involved in a war. Uh, so next, what happened was uh, uh, the King of Kashmir appealed to Lord Mountbatten, the Viceroy, overseeing the separation. Uh, now, backstory here, uh, the, the spouse of Lord Mountbatten uh, had a substantial amount of sway over policy, over the partition. She was having an affair with Nehru. Uh, Nehru was kind of known as a serial philanderer right until you know, the Kennedys knew it in the 1960s. They would always have an attractive woman sitting in the Oval Office when Nehru visited. And Nehru would, you know, couldn't even, for lack of a better description, keep his shit together if he, if he was in that environment. And he was having this hot and passionate toward affair with uh, Edwina Mountbatten, who was also uh, a very vivacious woman who had her share of relationships with ma men. And uh, theory is that she and Nehru had a conversation that later went to Lord Mountbatten. And Lord Mountbatten got involved in the conflict of Kashmir by offering the following terms to the King of Kashmir. He asked the King of Kashmir, look, if I can probably convince India to help you and fight a war if you agree to acceding your country to India formally by agreement and, and therefore becoming in part of India and an Indian state. Uh, the King of Kashmir was not just concerned about his population, he was concerned about his own wealth. Uh, if, he be, if Kashmir really was absorbed into Pakistan, uh, he would be history. Not necessarily killed, but he'd probably be thrown out and all of his wealth would probably, you know, stay in Pakistan. Uh, he didn't want that. Uh, he wanted to retain his wealth. And if that meant he was going to side with India personally, so be it. Lord Mountbatten. Kurt? Yeah. What was uh, Lord Mountbatten's, um, where was he coming from? Was, was he looking after British interest? Was he trying to be an honest broker? Was he a humanitarian? Was he a, a, I, Lord, a thieving Lord, capitalist? Yeah, no, Lord Mountbatten, uh, I mean, by all estimates, and I think this goes from you know the Indian leadership at the time and the Pakistani leadership, uh, he was considered a good guy. Uh, 
the British uh, at that point, exhausted from the, uh, the, the, the German bombardment of, of uh, the Second World War, really wanted to get the hell out of there. Uh, the British people were, were not really interested at that point in retaining these massive colonies. There was a substantial amount of damage done to British infrastructure. Cities such as Coventry uh, were devastated during the Second World War, during the Blitz, as well as the, uh, the V-2 rockets that Hitler sent over. So right. that honestly had a huge impact on giving India its independence, you know, possibly more so than even you know, Gandhi's uh, civil dis disobedience tactics, you know, if I look at it objectively. Uh, but the, the, the British hired Lord Mountbatten to basically oversee this partition and really to get the hell out of there. The, the Muslim population liked, the Muslim leadership liked Lord Mountbatten, the Hindu leadership liked Lord Mountbatten. He was considered an honest broker, Barry, to answer your question. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. So uh, Lord Mountbatten oversaw the accession agreement that the King of Kashmir signed and uh, basically gave over his quote unquote kingdom to India. As a result, as India agreed, in exchange, India invaded Kashmir. Uh, they were able to kick Pakistan out of 50% of Kashmir. They were not able to successfully take uh, a remaining one third of Kashmir and another area of Kashmir that Pakistan and China both claimed was their area. India did not want to get into a war with China at that, at that time. Uh, so they took about 50% of Kashmir back and gave it to the, uh, the king. And the king kept his kingdom and his wealth a as a result. Uh, that did not go very well. Uh, it didn't go you know, well over with uh, the Pakistani population, though, that there was this, uh, this uh, Muslim-majority province that was going to India. Uh, because otherwise that, you know, that didn't happen elsewhere. Bangladesh, right. which was on the other side of the subcontinent, decided to side with Pakistan uh, because that was a Muslim majority area also. So Pakistan was split into two. Kind of like if you know, you know, the Palestinian uh, situation where, the, you know, if there was a Palestinian, a Palestinian state, you know, there's Gaza and the West Bank. There's no connection between the two, no geographical connection. There's a separation. You know? And similarly, Pakistan was split into two parts, in the West and in the East. Uh, so when India was able to secure 50% of uh, Kashmir and bring it back into the fold of, bring it back, or bring it into the fold of India, uh, the United Nations got involved with the conflict. Uh, the United Nations, what they decided, uh, the Security Council decided that there had to be a plebiscite. It, this couldn't be something that, uh, you know, local kings and chieftains decide. Uh, what they, the terms of the plebiscite would be that India would have to withdraw its troops from the 50% of Kashmir that it took back or took. Uh, but similarly, Pakistan would have to draw back the tribesmen and some of its troops from the one third that it continued to retain. And then there would also be a plebiscite in the area that Pakistan and China contested. India said, sure, we'll withdraw our troops uh, right after you guys withdraw your troops to yeah. Pakistan. Uh, we'll do it on the same day, as a matter of fact. Pakistan said, we're not withdrawing our troops. The, the conflict is over the 50% that you guys took. Pakistan is already a Islamic country and the area that we took, it was, had over a 90% uh, Islamic population. Uh, so we're not gonna do that. Uh, furthermore, to add insult to injury for India, the United Nations appointed Admiral Nimitz of the United States to oversee the plebiscite. Earlier that year, now, so this is 1950, guys. Uh, you know, we're, we're, 1947 was the partition. 1950 is when the UN came in. Uh, earlier that year, uh, that conversation that I alluded to earlier between John Foster Dulles and Nehru 
had taken place where Nehru was asked to decide which way India was going to go. Were they going to go with the Soviets or are they going to go with the United States? And Nehru stated that he was non aligned. Pakistan didn't show the same vexation. Jinnah said, We're with the United States. Uh, they um, signed an agreement, and Truman at that point met with Jinnah and talked about the prospect of establishing a CIA base in Pakistan. Uh, not against India, but to kind of keep tabs with uh, uh, Uzbekistan, which at that point was firmly part of one of the Soviet states, not very far from the Pakistani border. Uh, they may even share a border. Yeah, they do. I'm going to hold up that map again of modern subcontinent of India up here. This area is Pakistan. Uzbekistan is right here. So a great place for the United States to have a CIA base. So uh, was the CIA base uh, primarily to spy on the Soviet Union? Correct, and, correct. Yeah. It didn't happen, Jinnah said no. Uh, so it didn't happen. But, uh, but what Pakistan did allow, what it, uh, that India did not allow, was uh, American corporations to come in and to uh, help in the development of the country. Uh, and because of this friendship at, at this point, which was disclosed to the rest of the world, uh, India, Nehru, did not trust Admiral Nimitz to oversee the plebiscite uh, in Kashmir. Aside from the fact that he did not withdraw the troops and Pakistan did not withdraw the troops. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially there was a standstill. Nothing happened. Uh, in the next Kashmir, big moment in Kashmir in 1962, Pakistan and China worked out a, an agreement and Pakistan ceded and gave up its claims to that portion of Kashmir that, um, that it contested with China. Mm -hmm. So China gave took to that. Gave it up to whom? To China. To China? Yeah. Mm. Remember, there, China, India, and Pakistan were all all had claims on portions of Kashmir. Uh, so uh, when, when China gave up its, I'm, I'm sorry, when Pakistan gave up its claim on eastern, northeastern Kashmir to China, now the only two players were India and Pakistan. Uh, now, we're going to take a, 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 a macro look at why, 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 why is Kashmir important? Why, why does Pakistan even really, really care about Pakistan? about Kashmir. The people there are broke. The, the territory is extremely difficult to maneuver and govern because of its, the, honestly, the altitude. You're talking about a good portion of that area being over 16,000 feet in altitude. Uh, very, very difficult to maneuver. No real farming, no agriculture. There are no gems. The gold and the diamonds that I talked about before did not come from Kashmir. What was the interest? Drugs. No. No? Not drugs. Water. Water. You uh, got it. You got it, Robin. Water. The Indus River, the Indus River, which, you know, that one of the great civilizations of the world, the Indus Valley of 5,000 years ago, that civilization uh, grew from the r river valley in that area that was being fed by the Indus River. That Indus River comes from Kashmir. That Indus River gives Pakistan its 30% of its agricultural uh, irrigation ability. If the Indus River for, ever, for any reason was ever blocked by India and diverted, there would be a famine in Pakistan unlike any that we've ever seen in human history. 30% of Pakistan, now you know, you're talking about a population of 165 million people, 30% of Pakistan rely on the agricultural produce that's, that directly comes from that river uh, that is directly responsible from, from the Indus River. Uh, that, would, that would go away overnight and there would be a famine. Now, India and Pakistan signed a treaty in 1960 stating that India would never do that, but a treaty is a treaty. You know, if, 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 they, if they broke the treaty, if, uh, if they chose to divert that river, 
there would be mass starvation in Pakistan mm -hmm. that could not be alleviated by any other manner, really. You know, mm -hmm. no foreign aid could feed a population that large, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if India were to divert or block that river. So that's why, that's why Pakistan, it, you know, it's, it's really part of its vital interest for survival that they have control of that river. Now, the glacier that feeds that river in the Himalayas, that is in Kashmir. So a critical, critical component of that country's survival, uh, that they're essentially trusting their most notorious adversary to exercise good faith and hope that they're gonna make good on that treaty at all mm -hmm. times. Uh, there was a brief war in 1965 over Kashmir. Uh, stalemate, nothing really happened. And now we're going to get to the big one, the 1971 war, which involved uh, the United States, involved the Soviet Union, involved many Middle Eastern countries. And if I ever wrote a book, uh, the, the, book the, the, the name of the book would be The Second Mu Mi Cuban Missile Crisis that no one, never, that no one knows about. Uh, so let me give a little bit of background. Uh, Pac East and West Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, had just suffered a horrific cyclone. Many of the folks, I think, uh, would probably remember a, the first World Benefit concert that George Harrison yeah. threw in yeah. 1971, the concert yeah. in Bangladesh. You had Ringo Starr, um, Eric Clapton, a lot, of, a lot of, you know, some of the biggest musicians of the world. That was the first live aid, really, before there was a live aid that was thrown. There were estimates of 300,000 to 500,000 people that died as a result of that cyclone in Bangladesh. Remember, Bangladesh at that point was still part of Pakistan. Right. Uh, the other part of Pakistan, West Pakistan, did not really contribute enough humanitarian assistance towards that, the, the, the cyclone ravaged area of Bangladesh at that point. That, that was the feeling of the people in Bangladesh, uh, that the, the world community took a bigger role in helping uh, Bangladesh than their brothers in the West, you know, their country. Uh, they just simply did not allocate enough resources. Uh, so what happened at the next election? It was actually the first general election in, in the history of Pakistan because a lot of the rulers at that point, after Jinnah, the, the first pa prime minister of Pakistan, they were military dictatorships after military dictatorship. Uh, in Pakistan. Uh, 1970 was the first, uh, first election. 1971 was the first general election in which all Pakistanis had a, a chance to vote. It was monitored by the Soviets, by the United States, and it was considered a very fair election. So what happened at that election? Something really strange. Uh, the party that ran Eastern Pakistan, Bangladesh, got a majority of the votes. Uh, that did not go over well in Western Pakistan. Up until that time, 1971, Western Pakistan basically called all the shots when it came to a trans pan Pakistan, you know, and pan Pakistan's policy. Eastern Pakistan, Bangladesh, really had very little say in the future of that country. They were much poorer. They were much more densely populated at that point. Uh, Honestly, they were much darker uh, in appearance. And there was always this, you know, East Pakistan, West Pakistan conflict where, you know, pa uh, East Pakistan, Bangladesh, they were the black sheep of Pakistan, uh, in some cases, literally. Uh, so there was an election and the East Pakistan, Bangladesh party got a majority of the votes in the National Assembly. The Western Pakistan party, uh, parties were all fractured. Uh, they couldn't get along. And as a result, they couldn't secure a majority. The Western Pakistan major National Assembly refused to seat the winners of the election. They said, uh, uh no way, we're not going to do that. Uh, you know, this was never going to be in the cards. Western Pakistan was always going to rule the roost. Uh, so what happened? Eastern Pakistan upset about the uh, response to the, uh, uh, to the cyclone, humanitarian efforts, uh, and now slapped in the face because their majority party was not seated in the parliament 
in the first general election in the country's history, they declared independence. They said, we're breaking away from Pakistan. We're going to form a country called Bangladesh. So in 1971, Bangladesh uh, declared its independence. Uh, Western Pakistan, now Pakistan, was not going to take that lying down. They just lost 180 million people uh, of their population overnight and a very strategic area in the Bay of Bengal that kind of oversaw Eastern India and their antics. Uh, they were able to then, uh, what they decided to do was invade East Pakistan or Bangladesh and retake it. Now, when they intervened and tried to retake Bangladesh, the newly created Bangladesh, uh, it was a humanitarian nightmare. Mm, uh, How the, could they do it? They were so far away. They had a big country in between them. Uh, they used their air force. They used, uh, so this was the first, what later turned into the third war between India and Pakistan. It was the first war that involved an extensive use of the air force, the navies of both countries, uh, as well as uh, troops. That Pakistan, that Pakistan sent into China and then come down uh, into, uh, oh, in, into East Pakistan. I'm, I'm, reason I'm looking away is I'm <coughs> pulling that map again. Uh, so West Pakistan here, Bangladesh here. Uh, West Pakistan took you know, their Navy around wow. the Indian Ocean and sent it up there into Bengal. They flew over their portion of Kashmir, over China, and conducted uh, uh, bombardment raids. And they also sent ground troops over China here and into uh, Bangladesh. Uh, that's, that's how they did it. Now, estimates are uh, that anywhere from 300,000 to 3 million Bangladeshis were killed by the Pakistani army at the time. Uh, the, in order to encourage excitement and um, people to volunteer into the Pakistani army, uh, certain fringed religious leaders in West Pakistan uh, told young men that non-Muslim uh, women were considered war booty. Uh, it was possibly one of the largest uh, instances of mass rape used as a policy since the Second World War. There were estimates of 200 to 400,000 rapes against women and girls mm. in, in that area. And you're talking about a pretty small, small geographic region, uh, the, you know, that portion of Bangladesh, which was carved out of the province of Bengal. Uh, what that turned into uh, was a, a massive refugee problem for India. Eight to, eight to 10 million refugees flowed into India. Now, India was pretty broke, a pretty poor country to begin with, and to absorb eight to 10 million refugees was simply something that that country could not really uh, sustain. Uh, so they began contemplating conducting uh, uh, a military operation to stop the flow of refugees from Bangladesh. Now, at the time that the systematic rapes were going on and the murders were going on, the United States had a consulate in East Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the, the consular officer, the consular general, the ambassador essentially, the American ambassador, his last name was Blood, he sent a telegram to Kissinger and Nixon saying, that he doesn't take the term genocide lightly since he had fought in the Second World War himself. He was a veteran in the European campaign. But he said what was taking place on the streets of Bangladesh was genocide and that the United States had to intervene or at the very least haul off their allies in Pakistan from committing atrocities on the streets. They were okay with taking the country back, but the rapes and the killings that were taking place on the streets, it was unbearable for the, uh, for, the, for the US consulate to deal with. And at the time, here's uh, to make matters interesting, Nixon and Kissinger ignored the telegram cable 
And because Nixon and Kissinger were working with the Pakistani prime minister, so this is where Bhutto comes in, the first Bhutto. Uh, he was the Pakistani prime minister running things at the time. Uh, he was assisting Kissinger in opening up the, si the, the relationship with China, with mm -hmm. P at the time Peking, Beijing later. Uh, so Pakistan was an inst uh, instrumental part of American foreign policy at the time because the United States saw the bigger issue as the Sino-Soviet split, the split between the USSR oh, yeah. right. and, and China. What was happening on the ground in Bangladesh was secondary. Uh, that wasn't of concern. So if the, the Nixon administration was nervous that if they placed restrictions on Pakistan's actions, that Pakistan was going to walk from Kissinger, walk from the table, and not provide Kissinger with this, you know, the, essentially this gold medal, the holy grail of developing a relationship with China. And Pakistan was on, like I said earlier, was on very good terms with China. They had just ceded over their control over a portion of Kashmir to China. Can so, I ask you a question about China? Yeah, go ahead, Grant. Um, why did China allow the, the West uh, yeah. Pakistanis to go through it to right. get to East Pakistan? Right. Was that in uh, their interest to have it all split up, divided up? Is that so? So China, no. So China had in 1962 when Pakistan uh, ceded its uh, its contesting of Eastern Kashmir to China, they, uh, Pakistan and China signed a military cooperation agreement. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So for an exchange for land, they were given, uh, you know, yeah. there was essentially this military friendship that was developed. Uh -huh. uh, so, that, so that's why later when, when uh, Pakistan called on a favor, it said, we need to go over essentially the land, we, we need an easement yeah. over the land that we gave you, yeah. uh -huh. portion of, to go and and re reclaim our our territory, Pax, uh, China was okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they had an agreement, a treaty in place, and uh, you know they they had secured a, a fairly non consequential economic area, but a consequential strategic area right. of eastern Kashmir that was essentially you know handed to them on a silver platter. Yeah. yeah. Without having to go to war. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, the the overriding policy uh, at the time for the United States was to secure a relationship with China and have it split from the USSR. Pakistan was going to facilitate that. Bhutto had a, gr a great relationship with Chow and Lai as well as Mao Zedong, and um, he eventually he did facilitate the relationship. But what it resulted in at the time was uh, the allowance of a genocide, as the American ambassador called it to take place on the streets of uh, Bangladesh. Mm. The refugee crisis, so going back into what we were talking about before, the refugee crisis that uh, took place in India at the time from Bangladesh, eight to 10, 10 million refugees, was unsustainable. India contemplated that it was cheaper probably to take military action in, um, in Bangladesh to secure its sovereignty than it was to absorb 10 million people uh, in, into, into the eastern part of India, which was also the poorest part of India too. Uh, so they had their own problems. While they were contemplating that, uh, Pakistan followed uh, an Israeli policy of peremptory strikes that had just take, taken place four years early in the 67 war and decided to invade Kash the Indian portion of Kashmir. So the part that India administered. And they commenced bombing over on the eastern part of India in the city called Agra. If you don't know Agra, yeah. that's, where the, yeah. that's where the Taj Mahal is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so they, be, they it was the first Air Force operation that Pakistan conducted against India. So now India was into the war now at this point. So there was essentially a, a formal declaration of war by both countries against one another. Uh, huh. The and this was in 1971. Uh, it again it involved uh, a massive tank battle, air force, navy, uh, and this is now this is the part where I call it the the uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis that most people don't know about. 
uh, and it's, it's the Cuban Missile Crisis in a Bizarro World. So uh, the United States was engaged in a war in Vietnam at that point, 1971, guys. Right. So we, the Seventh Fleet, our naval fleet, was in the Gulf of Tonkin at the time, mm. stationed there. When India reclaimed the portion of Kashmir that it lost in the 1971 war, and started moving further into Pakistan to take the rest of Kashmir, uh, the Pakistani portion. They weren't gonna mess with China, but they were willing to take, take a bet and go into the Pakistani portion of Kashmir, and they took it. Nixon ordered the, uh, the Seventh Fleet out of the Gulf of Tonkin into the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and, that happened within a very short period of time to provide assistance to Pakistan at the time. Um, to give Bhutto, again, who was gonna be the facilitator of this opening with China, the necessary credible support that the United States was ready to go back to bat for it. Uh, so the Seventh Fleet came into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, what's interesting at this point was that the United States, when they sent the, the, uh, the Seventh Fleet in, they also cabled to Indira Gandhi, who was the prime minister at the time, that the, uh, that the Seventh Fleet had nuclear weapons mm. and prepared to use them. About it, this it, it, war? About this particular? About this war. They would use yeah. nuclear weapons where? In India? In India, yeah. To get India out of Pakistan. And, you know, with... Population densities as they are now, only you know, even more so. But even then, uh, you're talking about an unavoidable, you know, catastrophe. Absolutely, you know, uh, of, of the use of uh, tactical nuclear weapons anywhere in India. Yeah, uh, no places that far apart from you know a major uh, civilian center. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I'm telling you this because uh, this, this is going to be a little interesting about the 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 instability of the region later. So this was cabled to Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi, the next step she took was uh, she reached out to Leonid Brezhnev in the Soviet oh, Union right. and said that the United States was bringing nuclear weapons into this conflict. So Brezhnev uh, ordered, uh, he gave a very stiff uh, warning to Nixon uh, to not proceed with this and he followed up his uh, words by sending uh, a nuclear submarine fleet into the Bay of Bengal to confront the uh, the United States, you know, the, the USS Enterprise, which was the main U the aircraft carrier at the time that was taken out of the Gulf of Tonkin, as well as the uh, the submarines and the the uh, the battle cruisers that were accompanying the USS Enterprise. The Soviets sent uh, nuclear submarines as well as a couple of destroyers uh, to essentially confront and engage uh, with the US, uh, the, the Seventh Fleet. What they did was they, they actually surrounded the USS Enterprise and it got to the point where the missile shoots of the submarines, the, the submarines surfaced and they opened their missile shoots to the point where the captain of the USS Enterprise was able to see that with binoculars. Uh, I mean, somebody have a question? No, no, I just said, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I was right. Yeah. Uh, now whether or not the, you know, this was an intense game of chicken, whether the, you know, whether we were actually going to use nuclear weapons in India, uh, is unknown. Whether the Soviets would have fired, uh, on the USS enterprise is unknown, but it was again, you know, the reason I call it the second missile Cuban uh, missile, excuse me, the second Cuban Missile Crisis, is it got that close. Uh, when, when, the, uh, when the Soviet submarine engaged with the USS Enterprise, uh, a cable was sent to Nixon. Nixon called off the, uh, they, told, they were given orders to stand down. And uh, within two days, uh, Pakistan surrendered and um, uh, allowed for the independence of, um, East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. Right. Uh, Bhutto went, the, 
Bhutto, the prime minister of Pakistan, went and met Indira Gandhi in person and explained to her that uh, taking over the rest of Kashmir was going to be an unsustainable endeavor on the part of India, uh, that it was going to result in a guerrilla war that India was not prepared to fight. And Bhutto was able to get his way. Uh, I think I hear a duck. That's my but, dog uh, playing with his toy. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just okay. mute yourself. Good. Yeah. Uh, so, folks, yeah, that. anyone, if anyone wants to mute themselves, they can do that and then unmute themselves when they have a question. Uh, I'm so, sure how to so, do that. oh, I was just going to invite Sandy to turn on the light because we're just looking at a black screen. But <laughs> around okay, sorry. There. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, okay, so uh, Wait, there, Jared, Jared also. Jared too, I guess. Where is he? Yeah. I don't. I don't see Jared right now. Oh, he was there. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Oh, so, yeah. I'm ten feet away from my uh, uh, from my tablet. And, yeah, Barry Kate is. Oh, okay. Oh. Hey, you know what I look like. Hey, Kurt. Does anybody have? Yeah. Well, maybe we should ask for questions. Uh, okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'll, so at that point, so there was a peace treaty between India and Pakistan. Uh, India gave back the portion of Pakistan that it had taken from Pakistan uh, because it bought Bhutto's argument that they did they were not interested in fighting a guerrilla war on a, a, in an area that honestly they weren't really that interested in. Uh, but they did retain the they did go back to the 1947 borders of the 50 percent of Kashmir that they previously had been acceded to through that agreement with the King of Kashmir. China retained their portion that was untouched and never up to question. So questions here over this crazy. So uh, let me just add one thing. The reason this was uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in a, in a bizarre world, because the United States supported a military dictatorship and the Russians, the Soviets, supported a liberal democracy. Uh, so it was kind of bizarre in terms of who, you know, uh, politics made strange bedfellows there. So it wasn't a situation where the democratic country supported the other democratic country and the autocratic country supported the other autocratic country. It was kind of in reverse, uh, which was kind of strange. But there were bigger foreign policy objectives that the, the superpowers had at the time. So yeah, questions about this conflict. I think or, Sally uh, had one. Do you have a question, Sally? Yeah, go ahead, Sally. You typed it in. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, Indira Gandhi was a pro popular prime minister. Why was she assassinated? How did that come about? Uh, there was a Sikh, uh, it's, it's, we're fast forwarding to 1984, but, uh, and not much to have to, not much to do with Kashmir, but, just to answer the question, there was a Sikh rebellion in, uh, I'm gonna hold up a map, in North Western India here. Not in Kashmir. No, not in Kashmir. Uh, the, the province known as Punjab, Punjab. Uh, which is split partly, part of it after the separation between India and Pakistan. Uh, part, it partly went to Pakistan, and then Pakistan decided to call it something else. And part of it went into uh, to India, a majority of which was part of India. Uh, the, the population of Punjab consists of a minority religion. The people are called Sikhs. Uh, you can differentiate them in the Indian population by the fact that the men, they wear you know prominent turbans and they keep their beards long. Uh, so... The Sikhs wanted to form their own country uh, in, 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 uh, in that area of the Punjab. Uh, and Indira Gandhi had a Sikh bodyguard who was partial to the cause of Sikh independence in, in that time of the 1980s, and he killed her. So it was- uh, Fine bodyguard, was, great. Yeah, well, I mean, she had a lot of bodyguards and, you know, and she had a lot of other Sikh bodyguards, which were, I'm sure, uh, very competent and very loyal, but, uh, you know, wrong place at the wrong time. And this guy uh, was able to pull it off. But th that that happened in 1984. Yeah, go ahead, Robin. 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, Kurt, this has been so interesting and part of history that I know nothing about. Or yeah. Uh, but what I wonder is if you could. Um, I would like to hear a more nuanced uh, approach towards the non-aligned movement, <laughs> um, because could you imagine what, how the world would have gotten through uh, those decades if, if it was totally paralyzed? In other words, a non-aligned movement was between the United, but, but between capitalism and communism, and um and many of those countries were were used as um what do you call it uh proxy wars Bronze. like right. Angola yeah. and so on and so forth that were totally devastating but if they uh, you know it, 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 my thought is that especially in the united nations that they performed a very important role to get issues to be discussed and to understand that a lot of the non-aligned people were former cap for former colonial um provinces of the big powers and they wanted their independence and they argued for it in the united nations and um, all that was a movement towards more democracy globally yeah uh so i mean you know Nehru, the first prime minister of India in the late 1940s into the 1950s, uh, was uh, was a chairman, chairperson of the uh, of the non-aligned movement, and India often took a leading role uh, in the non-aligned movement. Uh, the criticism, I think, internally in India with respect to Nehru's leadership in the non-aligned movement was. Uh, I, I don't think enough resources were committed uh, by by India and by Nehru specifically towards it. Uh, a lot of times, people kind of uh, um, criticize Nehru for being a uh, wanting to kind of wanting wanting to become a cult of personality uh, for himself more than uh, espousing and believing in the causes that he claimed that he believed in, especially after independence. Uh, and as a result, he didn't put his money where his mouth was when it came to the non-aligned movement, which I think if significant resources could have been put and invested in the non-aligned movement, it would have probably garnered a lot more uh, sway and support in much of the developing world that really, you know, they, they really weren't interested in this chess match between the Soviets and the United States and picking sides, you know, between uh, capitalism and com communism. I mean, the reality in most of these countries, including India and including Pakistan for that matter, was these were extremely, extremely poor countries mm. that in, in many cases that were trying to adopt capitalism and you can see the results of 50, 60 years of capitalism in a lot of these countries. They're not really that much better off than they were at the time of their independence. You know, some people profited, but a vast majority of the populations of these countries, I mean, I can definitely say for India, I don't want to speak for other countries, have not benefited from the capitalist system. They just really haven't. Yeah, I mean, certain people have, but they were often the people that were kind of doing well even under the British at the time. Yeah. So the, the, the wealthy class made more money. The wealthy became wealthier. Uh, the, the, the people that had you know, two or three possessions uh, to their name still have two to three possessions to their name. Except you know, maybe one of those is a smartphone now. But, um. but uh, so the non-aligned movement you know, was something that, uh, was a wonderful concept if more countries, you know, uh, if specifically if India probably invested a little bit more of its weight in it. Uh, but what often happened was some of these countries decided to take sides, you know, behind the scenes anyway. I mean, India, for a fact, definitely, you know, leaned towards the Soviet Union. I don't know. Not yeah, right. So yeah, go ahead. It, yeah. I think it's like quarter of eight, Kurt. I'm, I'm not certain um, how much longer 
we're going on. Uh, okay, so let me let me try to. I'll I'll bring it to the to the unless, present. Excuse me. Unless there's some other questions, are there other okay. questions? Other questions? Yeah, no? go ahead, Ian. Yeah, Ian's got his hand up. Where is Ian? I don't even see. Ian's him. got his hand up. Okay, now he's yeah, off. Yeah. Right. Um. So, Kurt, you you were talking about Earl Mark Mountbatten and how he was given given that responsibility for the partition in '47. Yeah. And um, and I understand that he was really on a um. On a on a schedule, you know, Britain was yes. really impatient to get out of this obligation of of the uh, the British Empire, at least in that in India. So um, Mountbatten made a very uh, hasty drawing of lines across the map to to determine to establish Pakistan and, and yeah. India as two separate countries. Well, the the um, Consequence of that rather arbitrary lining line on the ground was that there was a massive um, refugee yes. um, that, uh, crisis that, that ensued, and and that in turn triggered huge massacres. I think on you know on, on both sides, and yeah. so it, you know that's maybe a historical context that explains why India and Pakistan. As two separate countries, I got off into a really bad, bad start, um, and, yeah. and, and the memory of that would probably have, have, have affected things for, for years afterwards. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Ian brings up a very critical point. A critical point in the sense that uh, people that were in leadership positions in both countries uh, saw family, you know, fa family members uprooted, and treated extremely harshly you know uh both sides because there was a, a tremendous fear that people that were going to be on the muslim side uh, uh or people that were on the muslim side who happened to be hindu wanted to get the hell out of there and move to an area where they felt more com comfortable and 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 really vice versa uh the you know where muslims that were in majority hindu areas you know the the horse the horse trading and the jockeying that you know the leaders were doing was all fine and well, but a lot of the people really didn't believe that their security uh, was uh, was assured adequately, and they were very scared that they were going to you know number one not only lose their possessions but in in, in which case in many cases they did, but also lose their lives. Mm -hmm. The that movement that migration they they you know historically it's it's often been referred to as the second exodus the first one being of course in the old testament uh because it was a movement of a million people i'm sorry i'm sorry it was a movement of 10 million people of which during which the massacres that ian referred to resulted in over a million deaths uh uh reprisals back and forth between hindus and muslims and i i remember re reading an interview with uh I'm going to bring up another name that I said I wasn't going to, but a name uh, that I think most people will know. His name was uh, President Musharraf, his previous General Musharraf of Pakistan during the 9-11 time frame. And when he was interviewed, he said one of his earliest memories, he was actually, even though he's a president of Pakistan, he was from uh, the area known as Delhi, New Delhi. That's where his family was from. He was a Muslim that happened to live in New Delhi, right in the right smack in the middle of India. And one of the most uh, defining memories that he had as a child was when he and his family were uprooted and moved to what's now Pakistan. And the violence that they saw, the fact that they left everything that they had, which wasn't much, but it was everything they had uh, behind and were essentially spat on on their way out. And fortunately for their sake, the only thing that happened was they were spat on because much worse things happened for many of these people that moved from you know, one side to the other. And they, these memories lived in the, collective, you know, in the collective conscience of the leaders, specifically more so in the case of, of, of Pakistan, uh, because many of those leaders lived, their families were in the area known you know, now as India, so to speak, and they were their families were uprooted, and they didn't forget those you know, horrible experiences that they faced. What What do you think would have happened if if uh, Gandhi had not been assassinated in forty? What was it? Forty five. He, he, he no, he was assassinated 48, in forty eight. Right? Yeah, correct. So a year after independence, 
Uh, so Nandi was. Yeah. I've forgotten that he witnessed the whole uh, trauma. He he saw the whole trauma. He was uh, you know he was devastated. He was not in favor of partition. You know his famous quote at the time. Uh, you know uh, was when when it was a done deal that the country was going to be separated. He was standing between Nehru and Jinnah, and he and he looked at the two of them and he said that you know he said today my heart just split in two and I'm and I'm heartbroken. And once the once the split happened, you know Gandhi was essentially relegated to really smaller social causes at that point. The the big work of his life, the 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 independence of the Indian subcontinent had been done. So a lot of a lot of things that he got involved with were local Hindu Muslim riots, mm -hmm. and he was very emphatic on the. Hindu population of of which he was a member of right. to show a great deal of deference to the you know the the Muslim you know population and he at the end of the day because of the deference that he showed he was killed by one of his own people he was killed by a Hindu fanatic that thought he was bent that Gandhi was you know bending over backwards for Muslims and not looking after quote unquote his own people but you know, for Gandhi, all, all of the people were his own people. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I'm so, going to fast forward. Is there another question? Yeah, uh, I've got a question. Yeah, go the, ahead. The um, war between Hindus and Muslims sounds like it wasn't really religion. It was us and them. Yeah. Right? I mean, they didn't debate about uh, the nature no. of... No, no, no. They God weren't talking about like yeah. No, no, they weren't talking about heaven or who was keeping the Sabbath. And no, no, it, it was us versus them. Classic us versus them. Can I ask something? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sure. um, I've never understood uh, among them. It, it, it seems to have a lot of Muslims stayed. However, they didn't go. Yeah. And yeah. Who, who who would have stayed in those uh, in that climate? Okay, so I mean, uh, just a really really quick. Uh, I'm just going to throw out some facts, Grant, uh, uh, demographics. So India population, 1.339 billion. Uh, probably in about five years, it's going to overtake China that has 1.386 billion. Mm. Uh, but, yeah. So of that 1.339 billion, uh, 200 million people are Muslim in India. Uh, India is the third largest Muslim country in the world even right. though it's not a Muslim country. Uh, it comes after Indonesia and Pakistan. And the third largest Muslim country happens to be India with its minority population. Look, I mean, so Grant, uh, Nehru and to a lesser extent Gandhi, Gandhi was kind of done once he found out that, you know, things were, uh, the, the country was gonna split. But they did a, a, a substantial lobbying campaign uh, to Indian Muslims to claim that you know their security was assured, that they didn't have to leave the country, and that their rights in India were secured, their religious rights were, would be respected, and that they would not be harmed uh, in the long term. Uh, well, we're going to end our talk today with a little conversation just about that. Uh, but as a result, a fairly substantial 15 to 20 percent of the population of India itself continued to remain Muslim. They did not leave. Yeah. They, they did not leave. But a, a, a fair portion did leave. A fair portion did leave into the two extremes of the country, East and you know, East Pakistan, known as Bangladesh, and West Pakistan, which is today's Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I want to just jump back into that crazy war that I talked about where uh, the United States and the Soviet Union took sides. After uh, India was first confronted with the prospect of a nuclear attack by the United States. Mm, that's right. Mm. Two years later, India developed an atom bomb. In 1974, right. <laughs> India, yeah, in 1974, India exploded a conducted an above ground test in the de in its desert in its western desert of an of an atomic bomb so most people if they know a little bit about the region think 
that the nuclear, uh, you know, the nuclear yeah. race was largely due to the actions of one another. In India, in its in its archives of Indira Gandhi, they state India did not develop a nuclear weapon or acquire a nuclear weapon because of Pakistan. India acquired a nuclear weapon because of the threat posed by the United States wow. at the time. So a little fun fact yeah. for, for, for you trivia folks out there. Uh, so in what was the relationship with China at that time? Whose relationship with China, Barry? India's. India. Uh, not, not good. In 1962, the two clashed. Uh, they had a border war in which uh, right. China, China was able to take uh, a couple of very high altitude areas in the Himalayas for itself that they claimed were, were its territory. Uh, the Chinese were very well prepared. Uh, the, the story goes that the Indians sent troops at 18,000 feet wearing shorts and, and, sh and, and the, the equivalent of athletic <laughs> shoes. And a good portion of that, the, 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 the military force froze to death uh, when they fought the Chinese. So extremely ill-prepared uh, when they right. had this border skirmish with China. So the relationship was not okay, The good. reason I asked, yeah. the reason I asked was my memory, which is something I hadn't thought of in probably 20 or 30 years, was that India, as an American, my belief was that India um, developed its nuclear capability against China. Yeah, no, no. I mean, in, in Indira Gandhi's archives, and she was the prime minister that oversaw the explosion of that first nuclear device in 1974. The uh, China had never threatened the use of nuclear weapons, even in those border skirmish skirmishes. I think China developed a nuclear weapon in 64. I'm not certain. Uh, that border war took place in 62. So I guess they didn't have those weapons at the time. Uh, but the, the development of the nuclearization of South Asia was due to the intervention of the Seventh Fleet uh, know, from the United yeah. States, not because well, of well, you know, I, uh, Pakistan. It makes sense. Um, yeah. What I'm wondering is if my memory is correct, that the, um, you know, the media position, the, the uh, U.S. government position was that India developed uh, nuclear weapons because of China. Yeah. And yeah. so they would say that instead of, instead of against us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the information about the USS Enterprise and the Seventh Fleet uh, going into the Bay of Bengal uh, to support Pakistan, that was largely uh, classified and not declassified until relatively recently in, in, wow. here in our country, huh? uh, especially the prospect of the use of nuclear weapons uh, in, that, in that conflict. Anyway, I think, okay, any other questions? Um, Okay, any, any questions? So anyway, so going from there, so Pakistan developed a nuclear weapon uh, 20 years later. Uh, both countries tested their weapons in 1998, resulting in sanctions from the United States uh, under, under President Clinton. Uh, uh, a quick thing just to bring people up to speed, uh, Pakistan was also extreme, very instrumental in helping the United States in its proxy war in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. Right. Which most people say the amount of money that the Soviets spent in trying to control and take over Afghanistan probably bankrupted the, the Soviet Union right. in general. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pakistan was a, a staging force and the Pakistani intelligence was a, a, a platform from which the United States uh, was able to arm the Mujahideen uh, and, and, and essentially sabotage the Soviet army, the Red Army, every, every place that they could, they could be in Afghanistan. When, when the Soviets pulled out, uh, the, the intelligence services of, of Pakistan uh, ha had been overdeveloped through aid from the United States as well as aid you know, uh, from, from Pakistan itself. They really had not a, a whole lot to do. Uh, they were looking for other projects, and what they were doing was what they they started uh, 
um, supporting and and actually helping create different militant Islamic groups, uh, one of which was the Taliban, which we know today. The other, their prime aim was to go into uh, into Indian administered Kashmir and to basically just cause a ruckus there. Uh, they they it was a tit for tat situation where they made a secular Muslim population in Kashmir uh, radicalized. They they would go in. They would they would play, they would put force on uh, shutting down bars, shutting down restaurants, shutting down movie houses, and <clears throat> really Islamicizing the the area, which previously was secular, and uh, also placing a great deal of restrictions on Kashmiri Muslim women in terms of what they could do. Uh, what that would resu what that resulted in is uh, India moving in heavy artillery and committing essentially crimes against the uh, the Kashmiri uh, population through its military occupation in that area, uh, which resulted for the first time in a, in a forty year period of uh, a, a great deal of animosity. Uh, expressed by the local Kashmiri population, the Indian Kashmiri population against the government of India because they were essentially using heavy handed tactics. Uh, their intention was to fight these militants, but they didn't do an effective job uh, distinguishing who were good people and, and not so good people and who were a threat. And the over militarization of Kashmir resulted in uh, the situation that we have today. A uh, hundred thousand, close to a hundred thousand people have died in Kashmir, largely due to actions by the Indian military and by the Pakistani insurgent groups that have come in. Pakistan, through General Musharraf, or President Musharraf in 2015, admitted for the first time that it was largely responsible for uh, supporting and creating and training these groups along with the Taliban to 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 destabilize that region to, and hoping that the Kashmiri population would rise up against India. Uh, let me just move into the present right now to finish this up. Uh, I, I hate to only spend four minutes on it. Uh, it's up to you guys how long you want to talk about it. But uh, so there was a uh, an attack on a mil an Indian military barracks last summer. Uh, in, in the Indian part of Kashmir. Uh, the Indian government took that uh, as a, you know, to, to quote our friend Dick Cheney, no, no crisis should be, uh, you know, should be ignored, you know, if there's a, if there's a bad Every there. crisis should be used to somebody's advantage. Right, right. So that was a famous Dick Cheney quote after 9-11. So, uh, the Indian press with, you know, the, the government feeding the Indian press made, you know, it wasn't a nice thing that 40 soldiers died, but they made it into practically, you know, a second 9-11 uh, and got the country in a fury and said that something had to be done. This can't go on. And to some extent, there was this in undercurrent in the, the, the overall Indian population, even the Muslim Indian population, that you know, you can't have these terrorist attacks constantly taking place because over close to 100,000 people had died between 1989 and the present in these attacks. Uh, but Modi, now, you know, a new name in, in our conversation, Modi, the current prime minister of India, uh, took this attack on the military barracks as a, as a means to not only hit a target in Pakistan, uh, but also to revoke something called Article 35A of the Indian Constitution. Article 35A of the Indian Constitution uh, was an amendment passed in the 1950s. What it guaranteed to people in Kashmir is their autonomy. Uh, by autonomy, that meant that they had legislative control over their region, uh, the, the region known as Indian Kashmir, which again, as remember guys, that was 50% of the entirety of Kashmir. Uh, and, that was, and that is currently still controlled by India. Now it's essentially a state as of the last four or five months uh, of, uh, of India, like any other state. But uh, 
by revoking autonomy, uh, what, what happened was uh, Kashmiris had the exclusive right to vote for their own legislators. They had the right to apply Islamic law over their region should they decide to uh, do so. Uh, and they also had the exclusive right to own real estate in Kashmir. Indians from other parts of India could not go in there and let's say start building hotels and uh, open factories and vote uh, for election in election. Uh, all of that can now happen. Um, and uh, essentially, Kashmir, as of November of 2019, has been absorbed into India, just like Kash the Pakistani portion of Kashmir was absorbed into Pakistan, and then the Chinese portion has, uh, has been absorbed into China since 1962 in that case. Uh, so the likelihood of a, a dream that uh, even writers like Salman Rushdie have expressed of having an independent Kashmir, an independent state of Kashmir, hearkening back to you know ancient times. Uh, as of 2019, that will probably never happen at this point, based on the latest uh, uh, actions of the Modi government. Uh, the Modi government uh, has a fair amount of support uh, in India, uh, the India of, you know, the current India as we know it, uh, the political party that Modi belongs to, uh, they are referred to as a Hindu nationalist party in terms of its credo, its platform. However, the way they've actually been able to secure widespread support amongst, honestly, people in India that don't follow any religion or they could be Hindu in name only, but, you know, they don't go to temples or believe in any of the, uh, you know, the doctrines of Hinduism or Buddhism or any of that, you know, for that matter, is by using a, a secular general platform uh, in, its, uh, in its campaigning by what I think, I think, was it Grant or Ian, or maybe, I'm sorry, I think it was Grant that asked the question, how come 200 you know, million people, how come 200 million Muslims stayed in India? Weren't they scared that they were going to get killed uh, in 1947? Uh, what India promised through Nehru to Muslims uh, was a, a British law that was passed in 1937, which guaranteed Muslims the application of Muslim Islamic law, Sharia law, for all matters involving family, uh, family law, in, uh, estate planning, and the law of, you know, uh, ceding property. Uh, so there, India has two concurrent bodies of law that govern it. A secular law, which is not very different from our common law and the common law that they adopted from the British with respect to, you know, if a man and a woman were to get divorced or if uh, there was a contest regarding uh, inheritance rights. Uh, and then there's an Islamic law that applies to Muslims. So a, a Muslim man in India can marry up to four women, even in a, in a, in a, in a, in a quote unquote you secular country. Pardon me? Why would anybody want to do that? I'm not going to say anything, uh, Barry. That's, that's, your, that's your personal point of view. All right. uh, we, uh, the, uh, a fair majority of the participants here are women, so I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying anything. Uh, okay, but uh, a, a Muslim man can uh, marry up to four women. Uh, a Muslim girl is only allowed 25% of inheritance rights according to the way Sharia law is applied. Uh, a Muslim man can secure a divorce by a verbal proclamation and only be required to provide a woman two months uh, alimony and, and or child support, even if he had children with her. 
So this law has been in place since 1937. Yeah, Nehru guaranteed that this law would be un, un, unchanged uh, as part of his horse trading to secure Muslims to stay in India. And that law continues to this day. A lot of Hindu Indians and secular Indians and, and Christians, Jews, and Buddhists who do still live in the country really don't like the fact that that exists. Women of all religions are not crazy of the fact that, uh, that Islamic family law is applied and they have their own courts in India uh, that apply to them while they see their Christian, B Jewish, and Hindu sisters getting things like lifetime alimony and, li and child support until children are 18. Again, largely reflecting the uh, laws that the United States and Great Britain have, you know, slightly more progressive countries on those issues, as far as the courts are concerned. Uh, so there's an overwhelming belief in a lot of secular India that these laws need to end. Women's groups, feminist groups are against these laws and they, and again, politics, you know, creates strange bedfellows. They will often be on the same team with groups of Christians, with the groups of more radical Hindus on the basis of, you know, changing some of these laws. So they'll essentially form a coal, the most bizarre coalition, but on some of these rights, uh, these groups, you know, the, the Hindu nationalist group is probably, you know, using this as a political maneuver, but there's other groups in the country like women who really believe that these laws are, you know, antiquated, that they're just plain wrong, they're immoral, and should no longer have a place in a quote unquote, trying to be modern society of India. Uh, and uh, as a result, Modi has been very successful in forming a broad coalition wow. in India and support because his message to the population is not that, you know, everyone's got, gonna be praying to Krishna, Krishna and Shiva at the end of the day, uh, and everyone's gonna have to become a vegetarian. His, his, his message to the population in his campaigns is we're gonna have one secular law like our friend, now our friends, the Americans, the British, you know, the Germans, the French, every progressive country in the West. And there's a, you know, there's a big drive in a lot of India, you know, to quickly try to westernize a lot of its other areas of society. So, you know, of course, with the exception of religion. Oh, he's a progressive, you could say. Yeah, but chances are, Robin, you know, I don't, look, I don't know what's in the guy's heart, but I think he's, he's taking, care, taking advantage of an issue that he knows has broad support. When I, and when I say broad support, look, even a lot of Muslim people in India don't believe in those laws anymore. They think they're antiquated and a lot of Muslim women don't, you know, but uh, what he's doing is he's pitting different groups against one another, mm -hmm. uh, Modi, when I say he, uh, and taking advantage of that. And his party, the BJP, which is, you know, a, a, a party that its doctrines were based on a, a more fanatical form of Hinduism, has been able to sell a very broad-based secular message to much of the country. Even with respect to Kashmir, what he said is not that this is a, you know, this is a matter of religion or this is a matter of Indian control. His, 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 his go-to argument has, in, in India, not overseas, but in India, has always been, hey, if you're a Indian Christian, or an Indian Hindu, and you happen to want to move to Kashmir because of the great skiing there, uh, why should you not have the ability to vote for your legislators? Why should you not be able to own private property and, and, and start up a ski resort or a, 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 a cross-country skiing uh, facility? You know, why should that only go be reserved for a subset of the population? And that argument, you know, if you're an Indian and you have, you know, if you, if you look at the American full faith and credit clause in our constitution, what you should be able to do in Maine, you should be able to do in California. Why should there be a separate set of rights? So he makes a very cogent argument to the Indian population 
and uses a very secular uh, argument. Now, in terms of what he wants to do on his own, if he's able to accomplish all this, uh, you know, you probably want to look at his, you know, the, 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 the true party platform under which the party was formed under his party, his political party. But as far as when I, Robin placed a question to me, you know, a couple of days ago, and she said, you know, how did a country that had a, that produced a Gandhi, had produced a Nehru, you know, ha have a person like Modi? Well, Modi is not appealing to uh, a, a fanatical uh, message that his party, you know, possibly believes in. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's really appealing to a secular message where it's convenient for him, politically expedient for him, to secure a broad base. And if, if people are familiar with Indian politics at all, you don't have to be that familiar, but he won in a land, his party won in a landslide in the, in the most recent elections. Okay, Kurt. Hearing, yeah. I'm sorry, go that, ahead. That's, that's what I have to say. Uh, uh, if there are any questions, I know we went well over our time, but. But anyway, really, thank you very much. This is very, very enlightening for me who knew nothing about India, really. Yeah. I can't thank you enough. I don't know if anyone else has any final comments, but we're going to, the other thing is, is I wanted to mention, I think we should continue this forum um, at, you know, some time. I mean, we shouldn't let it go, in other words. I think, thank Sandy, you. What, what you and Robin are both doing, you know, with Vicky, I think it's, especially given the current time, you know, I just drove into Burlington today for the first time in a couple of weeks, and the streets are deserted. Uh, I think, you know, if we need to, maintain some sense of political allegiance, some sense of participatory <laughs> democracy, uh, and a uh, sense of community, maybe, I guess. Yeah. Uh, if this is the only way to do it, uh, you know, we need to keep it going. So you're doing important work by continuing this on a local and, I guess, international level. Look at Robin. What is she up to? <laughs> I think she just turned into the Buddha. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Anyone? I thought that was fascinating, Kurt. Yeah, Thank it you. was really good. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Thank Kurt, you. Sally was going to say something. Yeah. How about you, other she guys? She was just saying goodbye, and I just wanted to mention to people if you watch, if you can watch PBS right now, there's a uh, two shows on about Cuba. Oh wow! Thank you. So check it out. Oh, I will do Kurt. that. A any anything but the COVID uh, nineteen virus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That's that was another reason this is so important. <laughs> Yeah. It's a reminder that there are other issues right now. Yeah. 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 Thank okay. you. Okay. I'm going to end the um, the taping, the recording, and okay. uh, and we'll see what happens. Okay.